And this month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored in part by Allison Cook, Super Inframan, and Eric Hervin. Thank you all so much for your support. And if you want to become a patron and help support Where Did the Road Go, you can do so at wheredidtheroadgo.com. It's only $3 a month. You get extra content all month. You can also support the show through donations off the website or pick up some merch. All available at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And I am back again this week with Scott Crichton. Hey, Scott. Hello again. How are you? All right. Uh, and your book, The Great Pyramid Void Enigma, The Mystery of the Hall of the Ancestors. Uh, we talked about this last week. We're going to continue this week because there's a lot of stuff I really wanted to talk to you about here. And, and everything we talk about is basically scratching the surface of this book. This book is about 300 pages long. Roughly, if I'm remembering right, uh, I think yeah, just three twenty, something like that. Yeah, yep, somewhere in that range. So, uh, is this your longest book? Well, um, I, I it probably is, um, yeah. Soraya. Uh, yeah, I think it probably is. I, it was certainly um, the maximum was a hundred thousand words. So I reached that. I actually had to strip material out of it, uh, <laughs> you know, just to <laughs> to make it fit. So yeah. Yeah, I've not had to do that before, so it must be my longest book, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so we ended last week's show talking about the the pyramids as the body of Osiris. Yeah. A and, you, and in there, you also have a map showing like how Osiris is normally depicted and how that actually maps down to where all the pyramids are along the Nile. Yeah, I mean... That is just to me. That is just freaky. You know, I, I couldn't believe it when 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 I noticed that. I mean, okay, right. I'm not saying, you know, this this is you know, fact, but it's just one amazing uh, coincidence, correlation, if you can call it that. But yeah, if you take, you know, these sixteen body parts, these sixteen pyramids um, of Osiris. Well, we can forget the 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 small pyramids but you can take the others the big pyramids yeah yeah and you map them on google earth if you then take the iconic um figure of osiris you know with the three um pronged atif crown um and the the crook and flail you know he crosses his arms over with the the crook and flail he's you know if you take that iconic osiris um, image where he's standing like that and you map all the strategic points on the body of osiris the iconic body you then end up with a, a stick man of osiris and then if you then compare that with the, the locations of where the pyramids are built along the Nile, you end up with, I'm not, I'm not saying it's identical because it, it, it's disproportionate in certain places as you might expect because, you know, the, you know, that, that's, that, that's just bound to happen. But it's there. You know, you have yeah. this point at the top of the, you know, the, the, the middle part of the crown, the art of crown, then you have the three sprockets, if you like, of the crown. Three point, you know, it, it just falls all the way down. You end up with, you know, um, a figure that is very, very similar, you know, to you know the classic, as uh, iconic, um, standing Osiris figure with the, the crook and flail, with his arms crossed over. So yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's you know that's absolutely. <laughs> what they intended to do, I have no idea, but it may be someone in ancient times, you know, somehow managed to map these um, 
strategic points along the Nile and said, you know, and we're able to plot them on a, a piece of papyri or whatever. And, you know, maybe that's how the classic Cyrus figure came came about. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. But it, it's just fascinating that, you know, the pyramids, which the pyramid texts tell us, is the body of Osiris. Pyramid texts tell us pyramids are the construction of Osiris. And then when you join up these these 16 pyramids, or, you know, these main pyramids along the banks of the Nile, you end up with a classic Osiris stick man image of Osiris. It's just bizarre. Now, one of the things you mentioned earlier um, is that in the Coptic Egyptian texts, they basically say Khufu built the Great Pyramid. They say Surid or Saurid built the Great Pyramid. Now, I think it's uh, explained in the, the show last week, um, Soraya, is that Egyptologists believe, or um, some scholars believe, that um, Saurid is a corruption of the name Sufis. Which uh, Sufis is the name that the Egyptian priest Manitho um, um, refers to as Khufu. Okay? And, you know, so if Saurid is Sufis, Sufis is Khufu, then Saurid is Khufu, which is actually really quite important because it means that this legend, this so called legend, of Saurid. Well, you know, there's actually a bit of actual history. That's not... If that name is Sufis Khufu, then that's fact. That's not legendary at all. Right. You know, so, which, you know, adds, you know, gravitas to, uh, um, you know, this this oral tradition of Surid handed down to us, um, or passed down to us by the Coptic Egyptian people. Yeah, yeah. So how does that, I guess I guess what, what, what I struggle with a little is the timeline. Like, so when, when would the flooding have happened in right. Egypt? Well, you know, I struggle with the timeline all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, my, what I have in my head is this in terms of timeline, is that this is all connected to these cataclysmic, as we were saying last, saying last week, these are all connected with the cataclysmic events of around 12,000 years ago, right. 11,600 years ago. The Younger Dryas period, the cataclysmic events that were happening then, which brought all, you know, this megafauna and flora to disappear that caused the human bottleneck. <laughs> The construction of this project of Cyrus was precipitated, or the, these events precipitated, or were the catalyst, the catalyst for this project of Cyrus, the building of these sixteen pyramids. This was the people that lived at this time in Egypt. This was their response to try and rescue something of their civilization from this coming cataclysm. Now, remember, the Saudi legend tells us that the pole shift event happened first. They were actually watching it, which may sound kind of strange because most time you think that a pole shift event would be, you know, utterly devastating yeah, right yeah. across the world. And I'm sure it probably would be, you know, um, devastating in a lot of parts of the world. But if you're close um, to the pivot points of rotation, then it might not be so severe. And Egypt may well have been close to the pivot point of the rotation. Mm, right, right, uh, yeah. So, so it wouldn't have been as disastrous at those points. Now, if why are those, these priests then saying you know, there'll be a great flood in 300 years' time. Well, maybe they understood from previous post-shift catastrophes that had been handed down to them that that is what happened. That's what they were told happened previously. So they're, they're, they're repeating what happened previously because obviously if you've got 
massive ice sheets. There's always going to be an Arctic and an Antarctic region, polar regions of the Earth, where if they suddenly get shifted into temperate regions, they're going to melt and melt fairly rapidly. So maybe this is why they knew that several hundred years down the road, there's going to be a massive flood. Right. Because all that ice has got to go somewhere, you know. So that's maybe how they they knew this. So basically, I'm I'm pitching Surud as being the king about 12,000 years ago. That is, <laughs> and when I say Surud, if it is Khufu, then, you know, he's 12,000 years old. He's, he's not 4,500 BC. He's not. And here's the other thing, and this is where, you know, th these marks inside the Great Pyramid tie into this chronology, Saraya, because... When you look at, well, first of all, um, scholar um, Hans G. Godaik, he was a scholar of ancient Egyptian hieratic script. Now, let me just explain for your listeners what hieratic script is. Hieratic script is a, a basically shorthand or a sort of pen written script. It's not hieroglyphics chiseled into stone. You know, so it's not the monumental hieroglyphics. This is handwritten um, script. Now, in its early form, the handwritten script, what we call hieratic, would have used the hieroglyphic symbols. But over time, for quickness, the symbols, the hieroglyphic symbols, gradually evolved into different, you know, um, cursive forms. Right. Um, they, they were shortened for speed of writing, you know, they became ever more simplified, you know, and actually more difficult to read as a consequence. Hieratic is, uh, you know, by the time it completed its evolution, in no way looks like hieroglyphic, uh, monumental hieroglyphics. They're completely different. You wouldn't recognise them. But over time, this evolution took place over um, thousand thousands of years. Now, what you have to understand is that the ancient Egyptians, um, when they were writing this hieratic script, they wrote it initially in vertical columns, purely in vertical columns. And then there was a transitional phase where it was kind of mixed. They would write part of it in horizontal and part of it in vertical columns. And then eventually by about 1840 BC, everything was written horizontally. Hieratic script was written fully horizontally from about 1840 BC. Now, when you look at Fourth Dynasty scripts that we have, like the, the papyrus from Wadi al-Jarf, when you look at, there's, there's some... Um, Kanum Khufu markings that have been found on stones on the outside of the Great Pyramid. When you look at the, the cartouches there, when you look at um, most of the cartouches in the boat pits, they're all vertical. All of them are vertical. Hieratic script. Okay. Then you look in at the um, quarry marks that Howard Weiss discovered inside these hidden chambers, these sealed chambers, which he blasted his way into with gunpowder in 1837. When you look at the quarry marks or the hieratic script in there, it's all painted with red ochre, rough, roughly painted with red ochre. It's all fully horizontal. Not one single piece of it is vertically written script. Right. So that tells me that that script is from a completely different age, completely different period of ancient Egypt. Now, remember what I said a few minutes ago, the scholar Hans G. Godeik, now he was the world expert on the evolution of hieratic script. And he tells us, as does, um, you know, um, Said Ahmed, or Ahmed Said, who's the, or was the former... Um, 
um, professor of ancient Egyptian civilization in Cairo University tells us that this form of horizontal script started in the Middle Kingdom. Yeah. Yeah, about 1840 BC, the Middle Kingdom period. So what is a Middle Kingdom horizontal script doing inside a sealed chamber um, 700 years before it was ever even invented? The... Uh... Now, that... So that comes to the point about chronology. Yeah. They're using they're using the horizontal script inside the Great Pyramid to date it to 2500 BC, thereabouts. But that script itself, horizontally, purely horizontal script, didn't actually, according to these scholars, didn't actually arise fully in that form until about 1820, 1840 BC, 700 years or so later. Yeah. When you also look at some of the signs inside that script, they're also from that same period. There's a lot of signs there that didn't change, didn't evolve over this period, and they're still the same. But there's one or two signs there that did evolve quite radically, and one of them... It's the same period, Middle Kingdom, 12th Dynasty. That's its best evolutionary fit or match. It's from the 12th Dynasty, one of the signs inside those chambers that Howard Weiss blasted his way into and claimed he discovered these marks inside there. Well, how do you get a 12th Dynasty um, sign, symbol, inside a 4th Dynasty sealed tomb? I don't know. <laughs> you you actually present quite a bit of evidence in the last third of this book that adds to your Great Pyramid Hoax book fairly well, um, in, including that it, it, pretty damning evidence that he opened one of the chambers and then lied about when he opened it. Um, yeah. that That's one of the really interesting things. The other one was the fact that he had, there's there's one cartouche there or one, one, one sim, uh, set of symbols that... Um, one of the symbols was upside down, and then later on the actual, you know, when they go to, to check it, that symbol's no longer there. <laughs> it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible what went on in those chambers in 1837. You know, what we have are two documents, Saraya. We have uh, from two of Colonel Vice's assistants that both drew most of the marks in these chambers that were supposedly there at that time in these chambers. Now, there's one block in all of these chambers where the writing is the correct way up as you're standing looking at it in the chamber. It's the writing, the, the, the symbols are upright. Except this, you know, so it's just this one block and all the symbols on it are upright except one symbol. Yeah. It's the wrong way. Up, it's upside down. It's a hundred. It's turned round one hundred and eighty degrees. And the really strange thing as well is that symbol is there twice on that block. Now, the symbol that's upside down. It's, it's a symbol for the word gang crew. That's the last symbol an ancient Egyptian scribe would write because they're writing from right to left, and that symbol is always the leftmost side of any hieratic script. I hope this doesn't sound too tedious for your listeners. No, no. But you know, so that's the only symbol that's 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 there upside down. So why is an ancient Egyptian if, if that was an accident in a quarry and the ancient Egyptian scribe had the block, you know, that way round when he was painting that symbol the right way up, why is he painted the last symbol first? Yeah. Yeah. Which doesn't make any sense. Anyway, that's 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 by the by. That's just one other curious little anomaly. But so Mr. Perring draws, makes a copy of this block with all the symbols on it there, and he actually does two drawings of this. Makes two drawings of this, and and this sign is there in both of his drawings. Now later, Vice's other assistant, Mr. Hill, makes. 
facsimile copies, large sort of one-to-one copies of all of these signs so that you can send them to the British Museum. Now, when you look at, now I've went to the British Museum to look at Mr. Hill's drawings. I've also looked at Perring's, obviously. Now, when I looked at Mr. Per- uh, Mr. Hill's drawing of this same block, these same marks in this chamber, the upside upside down, weird upside down sign among all these other upright signs has vanished. Yeah. And there is a space there. And there's a space there on the wall. So it it was once there, and then it was removed. You know, what I think happened, now here's just a scenario. As I said, this is the only block with upright signs, with that one odd sign that was upside down. The only, every other block in the chamber, and all of these chambers, the marks are either sideways, drawn sideways, or they're completely upside down. So I'm thinking the forgers are thinking, well, now they're, they're making these signs upside down and sideways for a reason, because they want people to think that, oh, well, the block was originally the right way up in the quarry when they painted the signs. Right. And when they came, you know, that's why they're now upside down, because when they came to place a block to build the chambers they didn't care which way up it was you know so that's the orthodox explanation for that my my theory is that they deliberately did that to make it look as though they were painted at the quarry it's a ruse anyway this um sign um you know um was there you know on this block they're seeing that they've painted all these upside down and sideways signs then they think, oh, wait a minute. Statistically, maybe there should be at least one or two blocks where the signs are upright. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Right. But they started they started drawing it upside down. This next set of signs upside down, looked around and thought, hmm, no, we'll make this block the signs the right way up because we have to have at least one set of signs the right way up. And all you know, amongst all these other symbols on these blocks these different blocks so that's when they started doing it the same as they'd always done with all the other blocks painting them upside down and then thought ah no no we'll do this the right way up we'll come back we'll remove that you know uh, but before they came back to remove it mr perring doing his survey took a copy of it (laughs) right then it was removed, and then Mr. Hill came in and did his copy of it. It's no longer there, and that is why we have this discrepancy. It's an utterly absurd discrepancy, discrepancy which which essentially proves to me beyond any reasonable doubt that these marks were faked by these guys. They were making mistakes all over the place, and that is just probably one of the most obvious ones um, that they made, and as you said, there's a gap, you know, where where um, that that sign once was. Yeah. So, and and the other thing is, he doesn't mention in his journals finding any of these these symbols when he first opens the the chambers. Well, this is a strange thing, um, Soraya. When you're reading through his published account, now. His published account is what he wants us to know. Right. And that what happened. It's the, the sanitized um, version um, of his um, time at Giza. However, I managed to track down his actual field notes to a small library in Aylesbury, which is a small town just outside um, London in Buckinghamshire. I managed to track down his actual field notes, his handwritten notes to this small archive centre. And they tell a different story. They tell a story of Colonel Weiss, like every single chamber, he opened four chambers, and not once does his field notes, his handwritten notes, correlate at all with what he's telling us in his published account. Yeah. The timings are all off. He never mentions finding um, 
any hieroglyphics in Wellington's chamber. He tells us specifically there were marks there, but nothing like hieroglyphics. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's what he says in his, in his um, handwritten notes. There was mark, some marks there in, in red ochre, but nothing like hieroglyphics. Now, to hieroglyphics, he doesn't mean chisels. I mean, hieroglyphics device, it doesn't matter if they're painted or chiseled. Hieratic wasn't a thing. They were all just hieroglyphics device back then. Modern scholars make the distinction between what is hi hieratic from this period, what is hieratic from that period, what is hieroglyphic. That's all relatively new, but to Vice, it was all just hieroglyphics, and that is what he called, whether it's chiselled or written or painted, it's all yeah. just hieroglyphics to him. So he's writing, there was nothing like hieroglyphics in this chamber, in Wellington's chamber, that's what he says. And then, lo and behold, what does Mr Hill present in the British Museum? A cartouche from that chamber. You know, Vice, I, go ahead. Vice in his <laughs> in his published book says we went back and we found um, uh, the quarry marks. Whereas in his handwritten notes, he said they went back and they saw some markings, but there was nothing like hieroglyphics. And then Mr. Hill presents a cartouche from that chamber. And that's just one example, you know. Um, other examples are, um, you know, there's no mention in the first couple of days, the next chamber he opened was Nelson's chamber. The first one was Wellington's chamber. He named all these chambers after famous British dignitaries, military people, right. so forth, dignitaries. Nelson's chamber, um, he found, or the less have found, marks on the first day he opened that chamber. When you read, that's in the published account, that's what it says. You open the chamber, oh, and we found the quarry marks in there. When you read his private notes, there's no mention of any quarry marks being found at all. Yeah, he paints some quarry marks, uh, or he copies some quarry marks from that chamber two days later in his diary, but bizarrely, and I explain this in the book, bizarrely, he's copying them from the right side of the chamber. He's making a copy of these marks from the right side of the chamber. Essentially, um, it looks like he's employed a local Egyptian to cop as well as Hill and Raven to copy these marks or to paint these marks onto the wall. That's why the vice this guy started from the right, he's working left. Whereas when you look at Mr. Hill's copies of them, he's copied everything from the left, but because I think this Egyptian chap hadn't finished copying them onto the, the full wall yet he'd only done the right hand side of the wall, right, that's all right. that Vice copied, was the right hand side of the wall, because that is all that this Egyptian, who would paint from right to left, because yeah. he's Egyptian he would paint from right to left so anyway, that's how, and there's other examples of why I believe uh, another a local Egyptian was also employed in painting these, helping to paint these marks into the, the chamber. Anyway, so there's all the, then the next the next chamber, um, Lady Arbuthnot's. That's the most bizarre of all. Utterly, utterly, utterly most bizarre. Vice goes in. He writes in his diary the sixth of May, himself and Mister Raven, two guys go into this chamber. Now, this chamber has something like 120 painted quarry marks inside it. And they're fairly large, you know, between 12, 18 inches high, about two and a half feet, maybe three feet wide. You know, <laughs> these aren't small, tiny inscriptions. They've also had experience of two chambers below of fi supposedly finding painted marks on the walls there, according to the published account, not the, the, the handwritten account, but you, you go in Lady of Birthland's chamber and they go in there on the 6th and they spend a lot, they notice all sorts of things about that chamber, they're measuring that chamber, you know, they're taking measurements of it, they're looking at the walls and describing the walls, how they're, they're, they're more roughly built than the chambers below and so forth and so on, 
And then, no mention of any quarry marks. Yeah. He says, on the 10th, they went into the chamber and found the quarry marks. <laughs> 120. It's the most quarry marks of all the chambers put together. There are more quarry marks in Lady Arbuthnot's chamber than any other chamber. There are more quarry marks in there. There are more cartouches, obvious cartouches. There's something like six, uh, three or four you know, full, fully formed cartouches, about another three or four partial cartouches of Khufu, Kanum Khufu, or sorry, Kanum Khufu, Khufu's other name, you know, in that chamber. You know, so, and there's two guys who'd previously found, supposedly, all these quarry marks in these other chambers. Vice totally understands the importance of finding a cartouche because he says earlier in his book that this helps date these monuments, these structures. Yeah. He didn't see he didn't see a thing. Didn't see a thing. He just says in his book in the tent, the quarry marks were discovered after a, a care after um careful inspection, some minute inspection, something like that. Uh, quarry marks were discovered on this day. That is just absolute nonsense. The you know, he's expecting quarry marks to be found. He's not finding anything else in this chamber. He, even if there was dust on the wall, he'd have been, you know, brushing it. Oh yeah, you know, to see if there was any cartouches or anything. Two men didn't see a single quarry mark for four days. No, I just don't get that. I don't buy that at all. So, but there's a whole, there's a whole load of um, other issues with 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 that. Too. That's the chamber, incidentally, that the the, yeah. the the sign went missing from. At one one minute it's there, the next minute it's gone. You know, that's that's the chamber where you see the signs. You know, um, because the floor isn't level. Yeah, you see the gap between the floor and the block reduces, and you see the characters of the particular inscription, the hieratic signs, getting smaller and smaller as the space runs out. <laughs> that that means they've been written in situ. Yes. But, Soraya, why are they upside down? Yep. You know, if you're writing that in situ and you're running out of space and you're making the, the, the writing smaller and smaller, you know, the, the height, I'm talking about the height, is the gap is getting smaller and smaller between the ceiling and the floor – the gap is getting smaller and smaller, and you're making you're making the symbols smaller to fit the gap, and then that tells you it was done in situ. But if it was done in situ, why would anybody draw it upside down in situ? Right, right. So, so, so there's all this stuff. There's, you know, there. I mean, you know, it's like they're writing numbers back to front. They're getting it wrong. They're writing, you know. Egyptian numbers the wrong way around. There's just a ton of, you know, stuff. In Vice's diary, he even talks about um, Mr. getting Mr. Raven and Mr. Hill to put the Khufu cartouche, you know, on a particular trussing in Campbell's chamber. It's right there <laughs> in his handwritten notes. Of course, you're not going to read any of that in a sanitised public account. Absolutely not, for obvious reasons. Right. You know, and then there's other things as well. You know, he t he talks about, you know, um, he basically wanted um, Lady Arbuthnot's chamber to be to claim to the world that he opened it on the 9th of May. Not the 6th, the 9th. Yeah. That is why on Mr. Hill's but similarly drawings. He made six drawings from this chamber, Mr. Hill. They're all there. You can go and see them in the British Museum. And on each of these drawings, Vice has written, it's Vice's handwriting. I know Vice's handwriting now very, very well. I didn't <laughs> early on, but I do now. Vice is writing on those six facsimile drawings. Chamber was opened on the 9th of May. Right, and that is what he had Mr. Hill paint the dedication inscription to Lady Arbuthnot, 9th of May, Lady Arbuthnot's chamber, 9th of May, 1837. He wanted the discovery of those marks to be, and the chamber opening to be the same day, but something happened on the 10th, which forced him 
to he, he couldn't he it forced them to go back to the original open opening date revert to the original opening date but he couldn't change the date when he said the marks were discovered because he's already told um sir robert and lady arbuthnot that yeah. he found these on the ninth so yep. he can't change that part of the story but he could fudge the other part of his story you know so it, it, you know it's quite it's quite complex but what is really telling is that the inscription lady arbuthnot's chamber 9th May 1837. What's really telling is that in Vice's book, in the actual main narrative of his book, it's written as a diary, when you get to the 6th of May, in his published book, reading his diary, 6th of May 1837, he says, Lady Arbuthnot's chamber opened. Right? Now, in the appendix, I think it's his second volume, in the appendix of his second volume, He's got a list of all the inscriptions that were painted that he had, Mr. Hill, paint into these chambers. So this is what he's saying these inscriptions read. Now, so, you know, Campbell's chamber, you know, 27th, um, um, or 27th May, 1837. Right. Then we get to Lady Arbuthnot's chamber. Lady Arbuthnot's chamber... Now, this is the actual inscription that he's saying is in the chamber, on the chamber wall. He's saying it reads, Lady Arbuthnot's Chamber, 6th of May, 1837. Right. He's falsified the inscription Yep. in his published book. And he had to falsify that inscription because if he didn't falsify, he had to go back to the 6th of May in his diary he couldn't leave that saying the 9th of May because then people would say, but wait a minute, why does that say the 6th and that say the 9th? And then he'd get being asked all these awkward questions. And the other reason he probably had to revert to the original date was, was because Mr. Perring, who I believe was not part, at least not directly, may have turned a blind eye, but he was not directly part of any of the, the fraudulent activity that was going on, he published a book a year before Colonel Vice's book. And in his book, he he said that the chamber was opened on the 6th of May. Yeah. You know, So that may have also been the reason why Colonel Vice had to revert to the 6th of May and then change the inscription to read the 6th of May. When If you look at the photographs of it, even to this day, Soraya, if you look at photographs of it online, it says the 9th of May, and that's what uh, Vice wrote on all of Mr Hill's facsimile drawings that are in the British Museum, opened 9th of May, because that is what he wanted it to look like. Yeah, yeah. He couldn't have a four-day gap. He's trying to close the gap, but something very serious happened on the 10th of May, which I go into in the book, which yes. um, it's basically... Um, blew apart, um, you know, Colonel Vice's um, plan, basically. So what strikes me is that they're finding all these these paintings in in just these chambers. You would think, if there were so many in those chambers, they would also be found elsewhere. And the fact that they're not really is kind of an anomaly. Well, you find, uh, as, as I said, you, you do find, as I said previously, you do find um, some um, marks, uh, quarry marks have been found elsewhere. You know, um, as a, you know, some of uh, Kunum Khufu have been found on some of the exterior stones right, um, right. to the Great but Pyramid. I'm, but I mean internally, you would think there'd be something else, not just in these chambers. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the, 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 the really peculiar things is that there are five of these chambers, four of them vice blasted open with gunpowder. The first one, which is called Davison's Chamber, the one that's directly over um, the King's Chamber, has always been opened since the day the pyramid was built. That one was always accessible. And the strange thing is, no quarry marks have ever been found in that chamber. Right. Only the ones vice blasted open have these marks been found. Now, it would be a bit stupid of vice to place 
marks inside a chamber that had always been accessible because yeah, people yeah. would know. Wait a minute, those marks weren't there, you know, last week when I was here, or two months ago, or last year when I visited this chamber, those marks weren't there. Someone's put them there. No, you couldn't do that. They had to be in a place no one had ever had access to before that he was the first one into. Yeah. That's that's the only way this was going to work. Well, let me, let me ask you this. what What's your thought on the odd marks they found in the, the star chambers, in the star shafts? Well, that is another real, real peculiar anomaly because... If you look at the construction of the pyramid and the layer of the pyramid at which those marks were found in the star shaft, it's the same layer as Campbell's chamber roof blocks, okay? That's the very you know, uh, top chamber, relieving chamber, the very top one, Campbell's chamber, the last one that Vice blasted into. The star shaft where these marks are found were found is the very same level as that chamber. So these were being constructed at the same time. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because the pyramid is constructed layer by layer. Okay? Now, an Egyptian scholar, um, Mattiello, I think his name was, he believes that these marks are numbers. And he believes the number is, um, I think it's um, 121, something like that, 121. That's what he believes this number says. And he points to the number one. There's three symbols. He points to, well, that's the one. That, I believe, is 100, and that, I believe, is 20. Now, when you look um, at the, the marks in Campbell's chamber, that has numbers in it, too. Remember, I told you about those numbers. They've been written back to front. They've been written the wrong way around. Yeah, yeah. They would, ne they would never have been written um, like that as numbers. The way they've been written as hieratic numbers they simply would never have been written like that the way we observe them. So, because hieratic script is always written right to left, the highest number is always written first in hieratic script. But in Campbell's chamber, this hieratic script has the lowest number written first. It would never happen. You know, so there's all this, all these anomalies. I could be here all night, seriously, <laughs> yeah, Saraya, yeah. talking about the number of anomalies in with these marks in these chambers and all this stuff in Vice's private journal. Now, the issue here is the number 20 that was found in the star chamber, which Ma this scholar Mattiello believes is number 20. Now, the number 20 is also written in the vice chambers in a completely different script. Yeah. Completely different script. You know, I think hundreds, maybe even thousand years apart. You know, it makes no sense if they are numbers in the star shafts. We know the ones in Campbell's chamber are numbers. The number 20 is if, if Mattiello's right and that other one is 20, they're from completely different ages. Now, the one the one in Mattiello, there's no way anybody could ever paint anything in there. I mean, yeah. that, that's, that's not a chamber. It's a, it's a tiny hole. It's about eight, eight inches by eight inches cubed. It's about eight inches cubed. The size of this thing, you know, and it could only be accessed with a tiny robot rover, you know, yeah. um, which drilled a hole you know, to access that tiny, tiny space and put our camera, our endoscopic camera through it. And that's how we, we, we found these type, these markings in this tiny, tiny, completely humanly inaccessible place. But Campbell's chamber is totally accessible to humans. And the marks are large. And we have t the number 20 on the wall in that chamber and potentially the number 20 in the small star chamber where no human has ever gone. So they are absolutely genuine. So one of them has, I believe, well, if that's the number 20 there, and that's the way they were writing it at that time, there's absolutely no way that they would be writing it the way we observe it in Campbell's chamber at that time. You know, a construction project like that, you know, the, the language has evolved. 
you know, so you, you wouldn't be reverting back to, you know, different different forms of your language. You know, that's like us writing text today and then going back and writing and suddenly deciding in the next line to write in old English. Right, right. You know, you wouldn't do that, you know, but, but this is what we observe, you know. So the marks of in the tiny star chamber, if that is 20, then that is absolutely genuine. The other one isn't. The one that Vice found has to be a hoax because that's number 20 as well and a completely different script from a completely different time. Do you think it was just luck that he, he used the number 20? Well, no, because um, he, I, I don't know why, um, um, what the rationale was for placing these numbers on the blocks. Maybe he was counting them and... You know, because this is the other thing as well. It's actually very easy to learn um, Egyptian numbers, how to do them. And I believe Vice probably did learn because he, he had with him a book by the Egyptian scholar, the British Egyptian scholar, um, uh, Gardner, um, Sir John Gardner, and... Uh, um, Materia Hieroglyphica, that was the name of the book. It came out years, about five years or so before Howard Weiss ever left, you know, England for um, Egypt. So he had that book with him. And on page three of that book, it shows the Egyptian numbers. You can work out what, what 20 is, what 21 is, what 23 is. Page three of that book. You know, so he would have learned that very easily. And we know also that from, it's not in his published account, it's only in his private notes, that he purchased at very considerable expense an early copy of Champollion book and Rossellini's book, work. Now, these books were the, you know, the expert knowledge at the time on hieroglyphic writing. Not just hieroglyphics, but other aspects of Egyptian civilization as well, but particularly hieroglyphic writing. These were the the top books at the time by the experts at the time, Champollio and Rossellini. Now, these books, I said just a few moments ago, vice paid handsomely. We're talking for each book about $2,000, something like that per book. Mm -hmm. And today's money, damn. Would you, you know? Would you go out and spend two thousand dollars on a book? Well, you might for I don't know some book, but you know you'd have to be really discerning, you know, um, to spend that kind of money um, and really want something to find that to spend that kind of money on on a book. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, and we know that um, Howard Vice could understand the cartouche of Khufu. He knew what that, cush, that that cartouche was. He knew it was Khufu. He writes in his private notes, doesn't again, doesn't say it in his published notes, that he knew when he was in Giza that that was a cartouche of Khufu, the pyramid builder. He knew what cartouche it was. Now, people often say, oh, but, you know, there's all these other marks that, um, you know, like Vice's, uh, that Vice put in the... the, the these chambers, the Horus name of Khufu, which isn't in a cartouche. How did they know that that was the Horus name of Khufu? No one knew that at that time. No one. So what, well, Vice is the, the foremost expert in the world on hieratic script? Well, no, of course he's not. But all Vice needed to understand was Khufu. How was that written? That's his primer. Because here's the thing, Saraya. Generally, what you find is when the king's name is written, they write all his names together. He's different. A king had several different names. An ancient Egyptian king um, had several different names. But no one really understood that. They, they understood a king could have two names, maybe three. So when Vice finds Khufu, and he finds these other marks, he doesn't know what they really say. But because they've all been found together in the same context, it makes sense to just take the lot of that and just put it on these 
wall blocks inside these chambers. He doesn't really need to know what it says. The one thing he does need to know is that it's related to Khufu. Right. And that is the one thing, his primer, that was his primer, his um, his um, starter, what we say here in the UK, his starter for 10, you know, that was it. He knew Khufu's cartouche. He knew that was the cartouche of the Pyramid Builder. And anything else that was beside that, he just took the lot. And he, got, you know, and if, as I said, a king's name was generally always, is, you know, all of his names were generally written together. You know, you would see his his throne name, his birth name, his Horus name, they would generally all be written together. So it's not surprising that he found these names all together, or, or even though he didn't know it was a name, but they would all be together. So he just copies it all Um you know, into the, the the pyramid from his primer, which is the one thing he did know, and that is all he needed to know. Yeah. So, let's say they can actually get a look inside this void. What do you think they're going to find? Okay, well, this goes back to what we were discussing last week, um, Soraya. I explained that the ancient Egyptian people, of the pre-ancient Egyptian people, 12,000 years ago, this was their response to the earth changes at that time, building Project Osiris, the recovery system of Osiris. Inside this, they would put everything that their king, this is what the Surid legend tells us, the Coptic Egyptian Surid legend tells us, they placed everything that the kingdom would need for it to be reborn, for it to rise like a phoenix to be reborn. Now, what we have to understand also here, Sariah, is that to an ancient Egyptian, their king, now these are supposedly tombs of kings, their king was more important, in a lot of ways, was more important in death than he was in life. Because according to their religious beliefs, in death, the king's soul would go to the stars who were the gods and he could intercede with the gods for the benefit of the living kingdom. He, The king could ask the gods to ensure that the, the sun would rise, the Nile would flow, the crops would grow, the winds would blow, so on and so forth. The king's, that was the king's role in his afterlife. Mm. So that, if the king's body was ever destroyed or desecrated or destroyed and the king's soul could not then find the body, then the king would die what's called a second death and he would he would go to oblivion, his afterlife would end and he could no longer intercede with the gods. So that would be catastrophic. This is why they mummified their kings, was to prevent this decay from happening, or at least to try and slow it down as much as they possibly could. Right. You know, because of if, if the king's soul, when it came back each night to go back into the body, the mummified body, this is what they believed. If it couldn't recognize the body because it too decayed, that was it. End of story. Oblivion. You no know, catastrophe in the kingdom. So this is what they did. Okay, they preserved their kings, slowed down decay as much as possible. Now, if you're anticipating a great deluge which is going to completely destroy and wipe away your entire civilization, including these kings whose job in the afterlife it is to intercede with the gods to ensure, you know, the crops would grow, the winds would blow, so forth and so on, they're all about to get, you know, washed away in this almighty deluge, this cat great cataclysm that's coming. So what do you do? Because you want, it is in their power and only in their power, these deceased kings, the ancestor kings, it's only in their power to make sure that the living kingdom can continue to live because they are the only ones that can intercede with the gods to ensure that 
the annual rebirth of the kingdom continues, but also this cataclysmic, post-cataclysmic rebirth can also occur. But they're not going to be able to do that if they're all washed away. Right. So what do you do? You build a chamber, a massive chamber, because there's 27 of these ancestor kings. That's how many ancestor kings of Khufu, 27 of them, and their queens, into this massive chamber deep inside, high up, as far away from the floodwaters as you could possibly make them. Now, the one thing you absolutely do not do when you're building this chamber is have any passages to it because passages only attract robbers. Right. If there's a passage, sooner or later they'll get to your chamber. So you have no passages whatsoever. So how did they get all these kings in and queens in this massive pyramid void? Well, as I said, the pyramid has been built in layers. So at one point, you know, it's been built in layers. So it's open at the top. Yeah. Right. At the roof, there's no roof. So basically the lower each of the kings in, or sarcophagi, each into this void space that's open. And then as they build the pyramid up, it's sealed. So they're all in there, and there's not a single passage to it. And all the other chambers and passageways, well, I believe they served a different function to what we're told, but they would effectively act as decoys. Mm. Okay, but um, if you look inside the pyramid, the second pyramid of um, uh, at Giza G2, Giovanni Belzoni, Italian explorer, in 1818, he was the first modern person to get into the so-called burial chamber in G2. And when he managed eventually to prise the lid off of that stone box in that chamber, Soraya, what do you think he found? Nothing. Oh, he found something. Was it grain? It was earth. Yeah, okay. He found earth. He didn't know what to make of it. You know, Egyptologists, they'll tell us, oh, well, you know, the the king's body was stolen at some point in the past. And, yeah, they decided to just fill it with earth instead, you know, as you do. <laughs> of course. Well, wait a minute. What if the whole purpose of the pyramids was actually about the recovery of the earth, the kingdom? What would you put in these boxes symbolically? Oh, let me think. Earth? Of course. Of course you would. It's a Teutonic ritual about the recovery of the earth. That's why Bolzoni found earth in the stone box. It's also why, Saraya, when you look at the later dynasties of Egypt, they were making the people, the, the festival of Osiris, it's called the Festival of Kowak, which is an Osiris festival, a rebirth regeneration festival, they would make these small boxes. They're about 12, 18 inches long by a few inches deep, made, sometimes made of stone, alabaster, mostly made of wood. And inside these boxes, they would fill it with earth. And then they would place it in the ground and cover it over and place a large rock on top. Now, I wonder where they got that idea from. <laughs> they got that idea because these people knew what was inside these stone boxes and they knew it wasn't a body. It was earth because it was a Teutonic ritual about the recovery of the earth, the recovery of the kingdom after this deluge had decimated it. Now, I digress there. Back to the big void. So, You've placed all these kings inside there in Queens and you've covered it over. Great. There's no passages, so nobody will ever find that chamber. We only f found it just by the sheer magic of our modern um, technology, which I explained in the, the show last week. Right. Now, so 
we have um, got the bodies in there, but wait a minute. Um, what of the decay? What of the decay? Yeah. Well, this is why in an ancient Egyptian tomb, king's tomb, Sariah, the always, or not just the, the king, but you know other people, royalty, nobility, they would always be buried with um, what's called a Ka statue. Now, the Ka statue was essentially a substitute or a surrogate of the mummy. It was made in the likeness of the deceased so that if the soul returned to the, the mummified remains, the mummy, and couldn't recognise it, I would use the surrogate statue instead. That's what they did. That's what they believed. And so the king's soul could be reanimated into an ark and could go back to intercede with the gods. And this could continue in perpetuity forever. That's why they, they had the surrogate statues with them in their tomb. So, and it, and you find also that the, the statue is always at the lower part of the tomb. So where are the surrogate statues for these kings in the big void? Well, that explains the Grand Gallery. Yeah. Because in the Grand Gallery, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, um, Saraya, there are 27, what are called, um, sockets or shallow trenches in the, there's these two pavements or what you guys would call sidewalks on either side of the Grand Gallery from the bottom to the top of the Grand Gallery and there's these notches or sockets on the pavements and also a slight notch into the wall where each of these sockets are. Now, the sockets alternate, there's, a, there's one that's about... Um, three feet wide, the next one's about two and a half feet wide, and they alternate all the way up on both sides of the Grand Gallery. Now, an Egyptologist, um, a chap called Andre Pochan, uh, he wrote a book in the 1970s, and in that book he explains how some of the ancient um, texts that have come down to us um, tell us um, how when Al Mahmud, who was the first person in modern times to break into the Great Pyramid, when he first got into the Grand Gallery, what he found there was all of these statues. Yeah. He found all the statues inside um, the Great Pyramid. And what he says, the statues that um, Sufu, of Sufu's ancestors, that, that Khufu had amassed, you know, for his for his ancestors. Now, there's 27 sockets on either side, one for the king and his queen. And when you look back in Khufu's an ancestry, there's 27 ancestor kings and right. queens. And when you read the Coptic Egyptian texts, what they say is that Surud placed all his treasures, everything that the country would need, into the Great Pyramid including the bodies of his ancestors. That's what it says. And you also point out that those bodies are all missing from the tombs that have been found. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's just another piece of evidence which shows, see, this is one of the really, one of the biggest mysteries, Soraya, of ancient Egyptology is that, or ancient Egypt, is that, Khufu's mum or mom, you know, she was buried in an unmarked tomb at Giza. And I think it was the 1920s, um, the Egyptologist, famous American Egyptologist, George Reisner, um, discovered um, uh, a, I think his camera, he had a camera or one of his assistants um, had a camera there and it, it tumbled, it, one of the legs fell through some sand and it tumbled over and the, the, 
brushed away some some of the topsoil and found that there was a chamber there. Eventually, they dug down about a hundred feet or so, and they found a chamber, this shaft, and they found a chamber at the bottom of this shaft, and there was a sarcophagus inside this chamber, and they found some other um, seals, uh, wax seals with um, the name of Queen, um, oh gosh, what's that? Heteferes, or Heteferes, which was Khufu's mum. And they looked at the sarcophagus and it was still sealed. All the seals were still intact around the, the lid of the sarcophagus. So they knew it had not been opened since burial or since being placed in this chamber. Now, Reisner got all the press of the day into the chamber, you know, but, you know, um, you know, really sort of senior dignitaries and, you know, newspapers into the chamber for the grand opening. And they managed to eventually break the seals on the lid of the sarcophagus and eventually managed to prise the lid off, looked inside. Guess what they found? Not a thing. Not a thing. <laughs> she was no. She she wasn't there, you know. And the thing is, Sariah, there was there was sheets of gold leaf also found in this chamber. So, you know, there was no tomb robbers. They found they found that um, the base of the sarcophagus there was a stain there where someone's head had once rested. So they knew her body had been in there, but for some reason it was removed and the sarcophagus resealed. Yeah. And it wasn't the work of, you know, robbers because they would have just smashed the lid. You know, they would have taken the gold leaf. You know, yeah. this wasn't the work of, of, of grave robbers. It was the, the body was removed and the sarcophagus was ritually resealed. So the body was removed and taken and placed somewhere else. This shaft tomb, there was never a pyramid above it. There was never even a mastaba above this. This was very much a temporary tomb because this is Khufu's mum. She's the last one going in this big void and she probably died before the void or her space in the void was completed. So they had to find a temporary tomb for her, and this was it. And then when the void was ready, they took her out, resealed the tomb, and placed her in the big void. And this is what you find with other sarcophagi. You know, that she isn't the only one. There's several other kings that have been found in similar circumstances. Their, their bodies were once there, and the sarcophagus was resealed. And, you know... It's evidently not been the work of of tomb robbers. They wouldn't take the time to do that, right. you know. But the strange thing is, all these missing bodies and resealed sarcophagi are all all from the time before Khufu. None have been found from the time after Khufu. Yeah, that's so really it's significant. Just, yeah, isn't it? You know, because it's just exactly what. The Coptic Egyptian oral tradition tells us about Surud. He placed within the Great Pyramid the bodies of his ancestors, not his descendants, his ancestors. And that's all we have found of these missing bodies and empty sarcophagi is Khufu's ancestors. And what, what happened to the statues in the Grand Gallery? Because they're not there anymore, are they? Well, they would have... They, they're not there anymore. I mean, they would have been been um, pillaged long ago. Um, I imagine um, the um, were probably pillaged even before um, you know Al Mamun um, broke into um, the the Great Pyramid, and I think it was eight twenty AD. Because there is a way into the Great Pyramid, believe it or not, there is a way into it that would get you into the Grand Gallery. Um, it's it's called the well shaft, um, you know. So there was potentially a means into the grand gallery, 
um, via this this feature in the Great Pyramid called the Well Shaft, a very very narrow shaft and and, and tight, but it could still be done. Um, there's this thing called um, another Egyptian anomaly is is called the the um, oh gosh the the heads it's, they found these heads of ancient these statues are they're they're made of you know different types of stone. And all their ears have been cut off, or you know somehow they've lost their ears, and the back of their head has been you know um, damaged. Right. And you know <laughs> Egyptologists don't know why why this should happen. Well, if these were statues that were once in the Grand Gallery that once stood, these heads were part of a statue that once stood in the Grand Gallery. Well, they're never going to get full statue out of this well shaft. They may get the head out, but not the full statue. So what it looks like they've done, they've used some kind of wood, maybe behind the ears. The ears are kind of acting as, you know, fulcrum points. So, you know, um, so they've put levers behind the ears to pull or prise the statue away from the wall. And that's why some of these have lost their ears because, you know, they've broken off when they've tried to do this. And then failing that, they then get, you know, their their, their lever behind the, the head and prise that forward. And that's what's damaged the back of the head. And once they get it low enough, they can then cut the head off and take it down, out through the well shaft. So this is this maybe explains, they found about, you know, 40 or 50 of these heads, you know, just the head of these statues around in various tombs around Giza. So this may explain these heads that the ones these heads once stood are part or were part of these statues inside um, you know the 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 Grand Gallery and um, because the Grand Gal these statues were the surrogates so that if the bodies in you know the, the, the chamber above decayed so much the car the bar turning to the body, the mummified body, could use the surrogate of the individual instead. And so this rebirth of the kingdom could continue um, even if, you know, the, the body had decayed too badly. You you know, said, so they had it all figured out. You said there were 40 or 50 heads. How many statues would have been in the Grand Gallery? Well, there would have been um, 27 times 2. That's 54. Okay. So we may have found a good chunk of the heads, is what you're saying. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying this is fact. It's that's speculation. Right, right. Um, but and you, you know, you do a very good job in the book of of stating where you have facts versus what you're speculating about, and I love that. Yeah, I do try to do that. I may I may not do it everywhere, but I do. You know. Um, always try and do that because you know um, people often don't know um, whether. We are just speculating, or or this is a fact, you know. So it's always good to to try and explain to to people what's what. But sometimes I miss it, you know, because they're caught up in the moment. You know, it's like, yeah, you yeah. know. But um, yeah, I, I I do it where I can. But one of the, the the things that really irks me the most about all of my research, um, I can just say this, <laughs> Soraya, is the people that say, you know about the vice forgery, well, you know, for vice to have done this, you're saying that he copied these marks that he found somewhere outside the pyramid. Well, yeah, you may have all this other circumstantial evidence, but you have to find the original source. Right. You know, the marks that he, that he actually copied before, you know, you have a case, you know, and I think, what? You know, it's like, you know, imagine imagine there someone's got shot in the street, okay? You know, there's gunshot wounds, there's gunshot residue on them, there's um there's there's shell casings on the street, there's there's eyewitnesses that, that sort of happen. You know, the police can't make a case the, the police can't make a case because the gunman got away and took the gun with him. Right. So that's essentially what people are saying, you know, that, which is an absurd position. Of course, you can build a case on, 
you know, the circumstantial evidence at the crime scene, you know, as to whether something happened or not. And that's all I'm doing. Yeah, I hypothesise that um, Colonel Weiss must have had a source of marks to place inside these chambers because, as we know, there were these quarry marks around in other places. So they did exist. They did exist. You know, yeah. um, you know, th th there's no way Vice could have made these up. They are, are, I'm not saying they're genuine, authentic, the marks he, in these chambers are genuine, authentic, fourth dynasty, but they are authentic Egyptian symbols. Right, Just right. not written in the fourth dynasty, but they are authentic Egyptian symbols and sentences that he has found somewhere else and placed in there. Now, if people think that I have to find where he got them from before I have a case, well, I'm sorry, I just think that's an absolutely absurd yes. um, proposition because the evidence, the circumstantial evidence is overwhelming that, that, you know, there's just so many serious anomalies with those marks in those chambers that to me, um, it beggars belief that anybody today could think serious, they are seriously genuine Fourth Dynasty markings. Now, you, he does say in one of the entries that there were some quarry marks. So he doesn't talk about any of the, the cartouches or anything. I'm wondering if he saw something like what we saw down the star shaft. Well, he does say in his book, in a couple of places, his published account, that he, that he observed quarry marks to the south side of the pyramid and to the north side of the pyramid. He does tell us, and he actually draws some of them that he found in his published book. He's obviously not going to tell, if he found the marks that are inside these chambers there also, he's not going to tell us that. He's going to get rid of that because if anybody you know, found that and saw that they were identical to the marks that he found in the chamber, well, that would raise a lot of questions. In fact, there's actually quite a, a funny part inside his handwritten notes, which again isn't in his published account, where he, where he tells us that at north side of pyramid, he just writes, at the north side of the Great Pyramid, blew up stones. He's right, blowing right. up stones with gunpowder. You know, I don't know that it could have been for a, a genuine, you know, totally innocent reason. Well, or I could have been getting rid of stones that I've got the quarry marks on them that he found at the ones that he's placed. <laughs> no, it's one. Who knows? You know, as well, again, speculation. But you know, what what I'm saying though is, in his private journal, he makes just a a passing reference to see how they saw a couple couple quarry marks or something, not the whole chamber full, filled with symbols. And I'm wondering what those were that they saw that were quarry marks. Uh, that, you know, seemed to be completely different from what he eventually published finding? Um, well, in his published book, um, it, you know, it, it totally contradicts virtually every chamber, as I said earlier, it, could, it contradicts every oh, yeah, chamber yeah, yeah. That, that, that he entered, you know, it totally contradicts them. Um you know, so, and, you know, he's talking about, he found quarry marks on the north side of the pyramid, quarry marks on the south side. He, he presents some of them in his book. Oh, I, I thought, I thought the way I read it is that he found quarry marks in one of the chambers he opened, but not, not like what he ended up publishing, but like just a mark or two. Uh, yeah, in Wellington's chamber. In Wellington's okay. chamber, he says, in his private journal, he says, um, saw some markings that looked like quarry marks. That's what I'm but, thinking of. Yeah, but nothing like hieroglyphics. Yeah. Now, if you look, if you actually look at those, the particular marks he's talking about, they look like mason symbols. Mm. They look. You know, they're 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 kind of like um, uh, geometric shapes. Okay. They're, 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 oh, like geometric shapes, and then he adds, and uh, that these marks were near the f to the figure of a bird, so there's a bird as well, and then he add, so they weren't sentences, they weren't sort of uh, like Egyptian writing, they were just kind of odd symbols. So they were genuine, but they were the strange symbols. 
Um, so those strange symbols, which don't look like hieroglyphics, they may have been some kind of mason's marks, but they are genuine. Mr. Perring actually drew them. You can actually see them. Oh, okay. And, you know, maybe that was the, the language of the original builders. Who knows? Um, maybe they would have understood that, uh, that those particular, whatever they were. But Vice did, does mention those. He does say the, those particular strange marks were there, and he does add there was nothing like hieroglyphics. He right. says the, 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 these saw some marks like like quarry marks. In other words, they were red ochre paint, but they were nothing like hieroglyphics. That's what he says. And that's what he says um, in his notes. That is all he found. Right. And right. then, as I said, Mr. Hill then goes and presents a cartouche, which... <laughs> We know as ancient Egyptian signs, so you know where did that come from? Yeah, yeah, and I, you know? I, I, I don't think we we actually got to the the uh, the point with the him, him putting the number twenty there. Why do you think he used the number twenty? No, it's not just number twenty. It's other numbers. It's a number. F there's the it, it, it's kind of random. He's put number four there, the number eight there, oh, number twenty one okay. there. Okay. No, it's it's not just the number twenty. Sorry, I should have clarified that. I got no, it's you. Se several different numbers, but one of them is I believe twenty one. I think another one might be twenty two or twenty three, some like. That. But the number twenty, as well as the number ten and twelve, and okay, um, that makes and, sense. You know, yeah. It's, it's several different numbers are there. And the thing about this chamber is that if they uh, if they do get a look inside, we'll know whether or not what you're saying is right or not, hopefully. Well, that's it. I've nailed my colors to the mast, as I say. <laughs> so we'll see, yeah. And hopefully sooner rather than later, but who knows? Maybe maybe they'll look inside and be like, oh, we can't see anything. Never mind. We're just not going to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll be, that'll be, that'll be the... You know, yeah, that would be the real test, you know, whether we, we actually get to hear um, if they have found anything or not. Yeah. But hopefully we will. <laughs> All right. And again, people can find you where? Um, people can find me. I've got my landing page at Inner Traditions Bear and Company. Um, find my landing page at their website. Um, or alternatively, you can. Uh, I've got the alternative Egyptology forum on abovetopsecret.com. You go to the main page there and just scroll down through the forums. You'll see the Scott Crichton forum. You can start a new thread there or there's a thread there that you're interested in. Just, you know pop a message there and have a look at it. If I know the answer, I'll, I'll respond. <laughs> All right. And the book again is The Great Pyramid, Void Enigma, The Mystery of the Hall of the Ancestors. Thank you so much, Scott. Thanks again, Saraya. It's, it's been a, a, a few years since, uh, you know, we last spoke apart from last week, obviously, but you know, yeah, it's good to, it's good to be back, um, to back here again, speaking to yourself. I want to take a moment here to give a shout out to all of my Patreons, especially those pillaging $10 or more every month. Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Eric Hervin, Tim, Andrew Nichols, 100th Monkey Project, A.E. Gaia Quinta, Alex Whitcomb, Alfred Tuttle, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy Incommunicable, Chris Ernst, Craig Sisternos, Craig Parmenter, David Moore, Denise Sarek, Diane B., Dominic O'Malley, Duffy Doubter, Edu Camahort, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, J. Otto Bullet, James Lattimore, Johanna Rojas, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Kevin L., Layla Malden, Linz Jackson K., Luke Osborne, Mark Bowley, Mark Brady, Matt in Delaware, Patricia W., Paul Jeffries, Ray Benedetto, Riker and Stark, Roger Gonzalez, Sam Sharon, Sedgeter, Stone Wilderness, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, 36 Dingo, Tyler Glimstead, Walker, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, William Lovelace, Rand Collier, Stephen D., 
and Vincent Treewell. And an extra special thanks to Vincent for writing up recaps of every week's show. Thank you all so very much. You really do make this show possible. In 2019, the first Strange Realities Conference took place in Nashville, Tennessee. The pandemic and turmoil the following year could not stop 2020's conference from thriving in cyberspace as a live streaming event. Now, for 2021, the third annual Strange Realities Conference will combine these worlds into a paranormal hybrid event, live in person in Nashville and streaming online. Join us in exploring just how truly strange our reality can be with an interdimensional lineup of speakers presenting unique and intellectual perspectives on magic, mysteries, and the paranormal. Featuring Alan Greenfield, Dr. J. Michael Bennett, a.k.a. Dr. Future, Tim Banal, Soraya Ascath, Dr. Stephen Finley, Aaron Gullius, Amy Pachula, Brent Rains, Chris Ernst, Heather Mosher, Michael Hughes, Jose Herrera, Joshua Cutchin, Kiki Dombrowski, Nathan Isaac, P.D. Newman, Stephen Snyder, a.k.a. Recluse, David Metcalf, Timothy Renner, Steve Stockton, and Brent Collier. Tickets available at StrangeRealitiesConference.com. It's going to be amazing. So there was a lot more to this conversation, at least another 45 minutes. That will be for Patreons only. Actually, it's just going to be this whole part plus the extra segment since i didn't really break it up when we recorded it we just kept going because it was such an interesting conversation so if you want to become a patron it's only three dollars a month you get extra stuff all month long extra shows extra little gifts here and there and it really helps us out me in particular out continue making this show and uh getting interesting content or what i hope is interesting content for everyone and i will see you next time you have been listening to where did the road go this show is made possible in part from our patreons and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange you can always find everything where did the road go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com and thank you so much for your support <laughs>